On Ireland's wild western coast, in County Clare, there are men and women who have triumphed over hardship and war, famine and foreign invasion. A long life in a hard and beautiful land has produced a gentle people with deep wells of strength and courage. We'll meet them today as Discovery goes to Ireland. <laughs> Discovery 70, the award-winning program for young people with Bill Owen and Virginia Gibson. Come by the hills to the land where fancy is free and stand where the peaks meet the sky and the locks reach the Welcome to Discovery. We're in County Clare in Western Ireland, near where the River Shannon meets the Atlantic Ocean. This is the Republic of Ireland, 26 counties united to form a free and independent country after 700 years of British domination. This place, Dysart O.D., is a collection of monuments which are layered in time on the Clare country. This Celtic cross bears a tablet which reads, this cross was newly repaired by Michael O'Dea in 1683 and re-erected by Francis Hutchinson Singh in 1871. But that's only yesterday in terms of Irish history. Christianity came to Ireland in 431 A.D. and the land was already marked then by symbols, many of which still stand today. One of the oldest pre-Christian monoliths on the face of County Clare is this dolmen standing in stony silence in the wild country called the Burn. The name Burn means the Great Rock. Who put it here? No one knows. But people lived here, many people. And they left archaeological question marks like this one to tell us of their having lived. Castles came later, and with them, battles and destruction. And for sanctuary, for the monks during the raging wars, abbeys where the religious men could be somewhat safe. The abbey at Dysert O'D is from the early 7th century. Over one of its doorways is a semicircle of faces, monks, perhaps bishops, but really totally strangers to us, as are the men who built the dolmen. If those faces could speak, the language would be Gaelic, the ancient Irish language. Irish was the language spoken in the farmhouse of the Singh family. This house stood for 300 years among the ruins of Dysart O'D. Then, like the round tower, the abbey, the castle, and the cross, it, too, became part of the past. The fields and the abbeys are quiet now, except for goats and geese and grazing cattle. No one lives in the Singh farmhouse, except an itinerant herdsman. But we'd be making a big mistake to think that open space and silence betoken a vanished people, or even an abandoned language. <laughs> Ireland is still 40% agricultural, and of her 26 counties, Clare is one of the most seriously devoted to farming. Of all the lives lived in Clare, there's none more familiar with the land and with the people than the veterinarian of the village of Scariff, John Blake. Let's clean this a little bit. 
Mm. That'll do. Okay, bye. It's good. Stay where you are, Sean. Penny, can you get the door open up? Come on. Okay. Get up. Okay, I'll steady the head. Right? I think it's okay, Sean. Pick up the gear. John's wife, Eileen, is an O'Brien, and her family still lives next door in Scarra. She and John can communicate on the radio telephone. Hello? Hello? Yes, over. Yes, that's all right, over. Where are you? I'm at Sean Collins's in Capaban, over. Now, Mrs. O'Donnell called in for some powders. What are they, over? Get two ounces of antecedent powder once a day, over. And McLysett wants you in again to look at that animal, over. Okay, I look at that this evening. Will you do a test with me later on? Well, when the children go back after lunch, I'll be able to do that. The Blake children come home from school for their lunch. Olive is 11. Marion and Niall are twins, and they're 12. Michael is eight. Paul is six. There are just the five of them. But right around lunchtime, there seems to be a greater number. Children, time for school. Hurry, you'll be late. See you when you come home. Bye-bye. Paul. A century ago, the only language spoken really easily here would have been Irish. Then it nearly died out until the Irish Constitution re-established it as the first official language, with English as the second official language. Now, when I'm teaching Irish, I use toys and as many aids as possible to try and put the lesson across. And then, if I fail, I will just have to use a little bit of English, but we're only supposed to use the very minimum of English, you know, on the lesson. So if you'll excuse me now for a minute. Irish is taught as a subject, starting with the junior and senior infants class, of which Paul and Michael Blake are members. Each day, there's a half hour's Irish lesson. Now, see you soon, Mr. Chief Chef. I was speaking in order and glad of. Thought Teddy again more aged. Three guys leaning here, here and there. Three guys leaning down that way. Here I go, hurrying at me. Calling loose and roaring young. Did he get the last chance? Ooh, never leaning. Ooh, never leaning. Irish is a beautiful language with a rich heritage of prose and poetry. It's a proud national treasure, and it was very nearly lost through disuse. Now with Irish taught in the schools, it will live on. Paul and Michael, when they grow up, will be like most Irish. They'll have enough knowledge of the Irish language to speak a bit of it and to rely on it for those expressions that don't quite translate. The English spoken over here has a special lilt of its own, and we'll be well aware of it when Niall and his brothers go to the Ennis Calf Market to add a new member to the family's inventory of livestock. They'll go there with them in just a minute. Every Saturday morning in Market Square, Ennis Town, County Clare, there's an animal fair and a cow sale. Today, Niall Blake is here on business with the help of his father. I'm giving you 25. It's all bad, but it won't do. You'll have to advance. Make it even 25, money. 25, 10. Go on, divide 26, it. 26, huh? 10. No, I can't get more than that. 27 pounds. 
Go on, mark him now. I've got a pound to 2710. That's the best I can do. 2710 and 10 bob for loan. Yes. Uh, you've been very tough. Come down a bit. Give him a chance to go. You don't want all your own way with the young lad. No, I'd, I'd like to have a deal with the young lad, I'll wait to you. I like him. Yeah, he's a nice boy. <laughs> he's a nice boy. But listen. Okay, it's a deal, And I wouldn't so. sell him at that price to any other one, but for you. It's a good Go back along to his tail now. Go back along to his tail. Animals, the caring for them, the fondness for them, mixed with intelligence and common sense about them, is a heritage of the Irish people, and certainly nowhere more so than here in County Clare. The market is partly business and partly an excuse for country people to come into town and spend some time together. Uh, you haven't got cauliflower? No, he hasn't. Two shillings, yes. that's right. Thank you, William. Huh? Would you want to eat with your stick to roll up? What happened, my dad? Would they want to eat with your stick to roll up? Would you want to eat with your stick to roll up? Red Hereford, Yearling Mail, A3738, HI. Eileen Blake handles the clerical side of her husband's work. Much of his routine consists of tuberculosis testing and blood testing for brucellosis. This is a tuberculin test in progress. Seven, seven. E e two, e two, one, nine, seven. Warren okay. tag. C E. One two one two one tag. Hereford to your old mail. Red Hereford yearling mail three four double six seven M H. M H. What you said? The government pays for the TB testing, and it's one of the few really stable portions of John's income. The rest is a bit uncertain. The Blakes don't even bill. People either pay or they do not. If they don't pay, the veterinary services still continue. John looks at it as a part of his life in Clare, part of one man's responsibility to his neighbors. Animals are not all work for John. One thing he finds time for is the pleasure of horseback riding. And a boy that I thought was my own. Now this girl... A weekend night out is usually a night of music and friends at an inn along a country road. Before John and Eileen can give themselves a night out, urgent calls have to be attended to. Those that aren't urgent can be put off till the next morning. But morning always comes, so these nights out can't be very late. While as I was going over them far famed Perry Mountains, I met with Captain Farrell and his money he was counting. I first produced me pistol and I then produced me rapier saying, and deliver for ya army bow to savor with me ring dum a doo dum a da Quick ball to daddy o Quick ball to daddy o There's whiskey in the jar o How some take delight in the fishing and the bowling And others take delight in the rambling and the roving But I take delight in the juice of the barley And courting pretty women in the morning John Blake's life keeps him close to the people of County Clare, close to the land. His work is a more or less constant education for his five children. And at one time or another, each of them has gone along with him to answer a call which may bring life, or the end of life, to an animal. We'll go along with John and his son Michael as he answers an urgent call. And we'll do that in just a minute. A 
pregnant Frisian cow about to have her first calf is no respecter of Sunday as a day of rest. So an Irish country veterinarian finds himself working at least part of even this day. The night when winter days were dawning For we laughed and sang through the whole night long Seeing the summer sunrise in the morning John Blake keeps a record of cows that are about to give birth. Then he keeps in touch with the farmers when the animals start showing signs that the time is near. At some time or other, all of the Blake youngsters have accompanied their father on his rounds. Well, how would you like this? Find the calf. The cow doesn't inclined to lick, to lick the calf. Well, she's a young cow, and she's a bit frightened. Ah, uh, she's all right. I think they'll get together after the a bit now, the two of them. The calf will soon be getting up licking the cow. Why didn't the calf come out on his own? Because his front leg was bent back and was getting in the way. So I had to push him back and straighten out the leg so that the two legs came out like this. Are you right, Paddy? Yes. Have you some water for me? Thanks. Uh, Most of the thousand farmers who depend on John Blake are small landholders having as few as a dozen cows, sometimes fewer. For that reason, the well-being of what is maybe one of only two or three calves a year is a very serious thing in the family's economic outlook for the season. We weren't too far away, so it was grand. Good luck, sir, Paddy. Good luck, now. See you. Come on, kids. Ireland is a Catholic country. There are Protestants and Jews as well, but they're in the minority. For the Blakes, church is St. Joseph's in the village of Tumgraney. God on high, and on earth peace of men who are God's friends. We praise thee, we bless thee, we adore thee, we glorify thee. We give thee thanks for thy great glory. Lord God, heavenly King, God the Almighty Father, Lord Jesus Christ, only begotten Son, Lord God, Lamb of God, Son of the Father, thou takest away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. Thou takest away the sins of the world, receive our prayer. After Mass, John will be off again on his rounds with Niall and Michael. For the rest of the family, a day off, a picnic, and a retreat into Irish history. There's an island in the River Shannon where the family likes to go, called Holy Island, or in Irish, Inish Cultra. The River Shannon is the largest river in Ireland or Great Britain, so wide that at three places at least, it becomes a lake. This is one of those places, Loch Derg. Holy Island is just a half mile out into Loch Derg. It must have offered at least a hope of safety and sanctuary in the days of wars and castles, because abbeys and monastic settlements have been built and rebuilt here since the seventh century. remains of five churches and abbeys here, plus this round tower, which is 80 feet high and once was higher still, since it's missing a top story and a roof. They were built this way because the monks needed a place to hide. So they would climb up into it, close the door behind them after kicking the ladder away, and be safe 
till their pursuers tired and went away. The land these farms occupied was settled in the Middle Stone Age by Mesolithic hunters. They built tombs and monoliths before the Egyptians built the pyramids. They had a language before Julius Caesar invaded Britain. The Irish farmers who inherited this land are people who have time for each other, people who live with warmth and wit and self-respect. The people in the west of Ireland, in Clare and Galway and Kerry and Limerick, may have missed out on some rattle and clang of what we call progress, but they've made up for it by holding on to the natural rhythm of their lives. Industry and development have to come here if the west of Ireland is to survive in a complicated world. But here's one hope, at least, that they can come with grace and ease. We'll be back in just a minute. We hope you've enjoyed our visit to Ireland, an island just 300 miles long and never quite 200 miles across. If you'd like to find out more about this beautiful land and its people, ask your librarian for these books. Conor Cruz O'Brien introduces Ireland, and this book, Anna Keen by Deborah Love. Be sure to be with us next week for another exciting program as Discovery continues to discover the world. Bye-bye. Bye. Air travel arranged through and promotional consideration furnished by Irish International Airlines. This has been a Jules Power production in association with ABC News.